having a conversation with my friend, Eric Weaver, Dr. Eric Weaver. I actually met him at a retreat recently uh, that I held at a Silomar in California. Um, and he had a pretty uh, interesting and profound transformation that occurred shortly after retreat, uh, but we'll get into that. He also hosts a podcast and he interviewed me on his podcast that will be released um, in the near future called Race to Value. It's a healthcare podcast. Um, so without uh, further ado, this is Eric. Angelo, it's great to be with you today. Cool, man. I really appreciate you coming on. Um, I thought maybe we'd start with just um, a simple sort of sketch of your background, maybe a little bit about where you're from, what region you're from, um, maybe what sort of education you have and how, how you kind of uh, got into the, the um, interest in healthcare, healthcare administration and so forth. Sure. I appreciate that question. Um, I'm based in Austin, Texas, uh, born and raised in the central Texas area, um, was drawn to healthcare um, just in my my life journey, trying to find um, a way to uh, contribute meaningfully to society. I know you have that kind of altruistic um, underpinning as well. And um, along the way, um, you know, I um, got it. I saw some really dark underbelly kind of nastiness in the industry um, really um, just created a lot of suffering and had some, some PTSD around that actually. Uh, and uh, just in my own, you know, experience, you know, I really, I, I've been seeking uh, to find uh, equanimity and, and really um, what I do now is, um, you know, I, I, I'm still in the industry, but I run a learning collaborative. We're about to launch an institute um, that's really um, centered around value-based care and health equity. So we're trying to bring solutioning and create a, an ecosystem for peer learning and collaboration to really, you know, to the topic we talked about on our podcast, um, the race to value, really to find not only answers to lowering cost, improving patient outcomes, better experience, consumerism, equity, but it's also about resiliency and finding an end to suffering. So I, I, I've experienced a lot of suffering just in terms of uh, some things that I've seen um, you know, trying to to be a um, a leader and and uh, and and bring about awareness around some of the inequities we have in our society and in our inner healthcare industry, but also just as a human being. You know, I've seen just so much uh, suffering just based on our own identification with ego and the um, illusory self, and trying to uh, we identify with labels and thoughts, and we have this disease of the thinking mind, and um, and it's just as I've grown older and become more mature, I've identified with that. And I got into meditation a few years ago, you know, I've um, uh, just had some, some epiphanies and different things along the way, kind of glimpses into kind of uh, unfiltered reality and just being aware. And, uh, you know, I found out about you, Angelo, through uh, Z Dog MD. Uh, I've been following, you know, him for a while. You know, he's, he's now, you know, a good friend of ours. He was at the retreat. Um, but just, you know, I, I, I was called. It was almost, um, uh, it was just serendipity that how all that came to be with the retreat and how everything came together. And just during that experience, I, I just had just such a profound shift in my own consciousness and, you know, sense of being and just feeling into the present moment and having just such loving awareness. And, um, you know, I'm still trying to uh, integrate with that and, you know, make sense of that, this new reality that I'm experiencing and being awake. But uh, yeah, it's been a, it, you know, uh, you know, your work is just so meaningful uh, to so many people. And, you know, I'm just honored to, have a platform to give you a voice and, you know, and I appreciate you um, having me on today's um, show as well to, you know, talk a little bit about what I'm going through and my experience. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I really like to um, highlight in these, in this series of videos, uh, the, the sort of just personal side, the personal aspect of uh, going through this process. I find that, um, I don't necessarily make a huge point of stripping away spiritual terminology and so forth, but I think it's just really valuable to 
uh, meet on a human level to talk about the usual feelings, concerns, uh, questions that people have growing up about the things that we often don't talk about, like identity, thoughts, emotion, suffering, um, and just bring that into focus with a, a, a very real person and a very real, you know, um, typical life that, that we live and someone that has gone through this significant and deep transformation. Um, and, and really, that's that's what I think people get out of these conversations is just they relate. It's relatable. And you're, you're a very relatable person, I, I found from meeting you. I, I, I felt that. Um, so you mentioned that you had picked up on earlier in life, picked up, picked up on a sense of, uh, that there, that there's suffering. There's like that sort of unnecessary amount of suffering around perhaps personal suffering, but also suffering out there in the world. Um, and even that you had some insights into the nature of, of the suffering being related to thought and so forth. Can you give me any examples, maybe when you were younger or some, sometimes people even get these, you know, little glimpses of child, but did you have any sense early in life or a moment that really kind of made you stand back and say, maybe there's something more going on than what I've learned? You know, I, um, I, I grew up in a, a very stable, you know, uh, household, um, loving environment. Um, but I had a sis, my, my sis, my older sister, um, deals with a lot of, uh, uh, emotional issues. And I saw how she was just, um, afflicted with just incessant thinking and worrying about the past and the future and, and just creating a narrative in her, in her mind that, uh, really created uh, her own self-imposed suffering. And I was very young and, you know, saw, you know, how that I- impacted her life. And, you know, I internalized that. That was kind of a seed for me to um, just really get to understand a little bit more about not only thinking, but societally, you know, how we're conditioned. Um, I, and now as I've kind of um, matured and, and, you know, become more wise in terms of, uh, the life that we live, you know, I just see how so much, um, that, you know, happens with suffering and friction and war and, and, uh, just things that we do to each other as human beings that is, a result of our own identification with self, the, the little self, the ego person. And um, I think along the way, you know, as I said, I, I've seen some, some kind of dark things uh, where, you know, I, I just knew that I had this, this yearning to, you know, find my authenticity and my true self and, um, you know, and, and I'm still discover trying to find that and I'm on the path to doing that and, you know, uh, you know, finding pointers and things, but I think it's just trying to lift that veil, uh, where I can actually, you know, have that, have that wide, you know, open sphere of experience where I can truly, take away all the perceptions and disentangle myself from all of my sense of who I, who I'm supposed to be, who, um, you know, thoughts that, that, that come about based on, um, interactions and, and things. And now that I'm experiencing this awakening, I'm now seeing, you know, this experience as, um, more of, um, like textures that that really don't define me, but um, create a sense of um, uh, awareness. Uh, and it's all about, I think, just the finding a way to navigate. But, you know, to answer your question, though, I think it was just, um, you know, seeing, you know, uh, what my sister, you know, uh, has gone through, what she's dealing with, um, seeing, you know, those in, in society that just, um, you, you now I can sense it energetically when I, when I go out in public, you know, there's, there's a lot of hurting and suffering and, mm-hmm. and I just see how, how it doesn't have to be that way. So that's kind of my calling is just trying to, 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 to understand, you know, uh, in a very, um, 
a, a, I don't know if the word spiritual is, is appropriate, um, but just uh, you because, you know, there, there are some elements to that, but it's just just loving awareness and just being and exper- mm-hmm. experientially um, feeling into the moment. You know, that's what I'm really wanting to do. And mm-hmm. I think, you know, I'm so grateful that you've kind of get, given me some pointers on how to do that. Yeah, I, I, it strikes me as we talk that how heart based you are um, and and naturally compassionate. I mean, what I think it takes some evolution, really, um, with practitioners, people going through awakening processes and so forth to just come to that gut level instinct that this really isn't about me as much. Of course, I, I can't deny that I, I have my own, you know, um, issues and, and, and emotions and thought structures, but there's, there's a bigger picture that is really compelling. And that is the, the bigger picture of human suffering that we cause suffering to ourselves. We cause suffering to others. And you seem to very genuinely and naturally orient to that, which I think is awesome. Um, and it's, it's admirable, but I also relate to it. Like I felt growing up myself, I felt this just massive suffering around me in, in my family and, and in the people I would just bump into. And as I grew older, it became concentrated in myself, you know, and I, I could see the mechanism of it forming, solidifying and so forth. And that's what became very painful. So that, so that I really had to wake up, but um, so I can relate to a lot of what you've said. Uh, I'm curious, uh, what, uh, at what point did you, uh, how can I say this? Um, at what point did you decide or intuit that this maybe is going to take a spiritual turn, perhaps a, like as a, as a specific inward journey? Uh, maybe how did you learn to meditate or why did you decide to take up meditation? Uh, something like that. Well, before I um, began meditation and, and, and really trying to, 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 understand the present moment and ex- experience that I was always a doer and a seeker and an achiever. You know, I, um, you know, uh, have a doctorate in healthcare administration. I've, you know, pu- been published. I've uh, done a lot of things in my career and I've done good work, but I always felt like, you know, as a leader, you know, my, I was hitting that lid of like leadership effectiveness and, and there's, so much that I've, I've realized along the way where, you know, there's being smart in terms of book smart, you know, you know, understanding, uh, healthcare and law and business, but then there's this human, um, aspect of it, like the social emotional learning or emotional intelligence. And I, that was kind of, uh, the beginning of me, like trying to understand, like emotionally, how can I, um, be more stable and, um, interact with other human beings. And, uh, so I, I began meditating and, and then just, you know, thinking about, um, uh, dependent origination and how like, we're all like interlinked and connected and that, um, it's not all about me, the doer and trying to seek and achieve and earn. And, and, uh, it's about doing right in the world. And, you know, I, I just was called to, to, you know, ju- you know, start this awakening journey just, to to feel into that and, and sense like how, how can I connect in a more meaningful way, connect with people, but also connect with myself and be open um, in a way that I previously wasn't, you know, um, open before. And along this, you know, the last, you know, few months, I've really had some major breakthroughs and, you know, breaking through those identity structures. And, and, you know, interestingly, it's, you know, just remembering the story of me, Mm. (laughs) you know, me as in, you know, uh, who I am authentically and trying to feel into those unfathomable depths and reaching that impulse mm. and just really just trying to inherit my birthright, <laughs> you know, uh, yeah. just, uh, and I think part of that is just, just having a massive dis- dissolution of ego and the doer and the seeker and the achiever and all the things that made me up until this point, like how I define myself and my existence. And not that I don't, I, you know, I, I'm, I, I, I still seek that. And, you know, and, and uh, this, uh, this, this, 
reality that we live in, you know, I'm, I'm always looking to, to, to accomplish and do right, but just really feeling into that kind of non-dual, you know, presence where, Mm -hmm. you know, like, um, I'm trying to put it into words, but I think just being, you know, aligned or open and, and, and just feeling into that. So then I can, through that open awareness, um, be present. And, mm-hmm. and, and so in every luminal moment when I'm interacting or, or I am doing and I am seeking, I'm aware mm. And because previously I wasn't aware. So I think just meditation has been really, um, it's been really powerful, um, profound for me and just creating not only that kind of internal stability, but just being able to transcend suffering and uh create you know that composure and equanimity that i've been seeking and i never knew how to do that um before um and i'm still learning you know and i have moments where you know like you know i might get upset but i i don't i identify with that now where like if you know before you know if someone you know, um, cut me off, you know, on traffic or something, I I might get upset, you know, Mm -hmm. and I I would see how my sister would react to that where, you know, if if that happened to her, um, you know, for weeks, she would talk about it. She'd be Mm -hmm. upset. I mean, it would would like perturb her and uh, create a lot of volatility and, you know, just um, agitation. And uh, so I've always had a a knowing that that's not how I want to be, but then I own my own identification with, or false identification with the world created like for me always this tension or this friction. So meditation has been a way, I think for me to um, just understand and be aware and, 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 and know where people are coming from. Like I don't personalize um, things now because everyone's going through their own experience in this world. Mm-hmm. And I, and understanding my own suffering, I've been able to understand the suffering of others in a way mm-hmm. that uniquely I wasn't able to before. So I think mm-hmm. that's kind of, you know, where I'm, where I wanted to go, you know, and responding to your question is just, you know, uh, I think this journey has been really creating awareness in a way mm-hmm. that I never had it before. Yeah. What type of meditation did you, did you learn when you first started? Well, um, I started using Sam Harris's app waking up and, uh, I still use it, um, daily. And, uh, I also did a lot of, um, uh, floating like sensory deprivation. That was really, um, my major breakthrough. I had a, just a float center, like about a mile away from my house and just on a whim, mm-hmm. you know, I started floating and, and I, I didn't even connect it with meditation. And a lot of people I would tell, like, tell them I'm floating. They're like, okay, you go into like a tank of water in, in your dark and it's darkness and you just <laughs> sit there. And, right. and like, what is that? That's, that's, you're, you're, that's weird. Like you're mm-hmm. that people couldn't understand it, but I started a float practice, you know, just, uh, you know, I would go every couple of days and, you know, I, and so, and then I got to a point where, you know, I would go into the the tank and I would, I would, be there for like four hours and just, mm. and, and so you're floating in like Epsom salt and there's no sensory um, stimulation, you know, complete mm-hmm. darkness, no smell, mm. uh, no sight. You're floating in space. And I didn't connect it with meditation, but at some point when I started floating, like meditation and, and that practice kind of converged together mm. and, uh, and it kind of set me on a path. So that's, yeah, that, that was a big, a big shift for me and, you know, starting, you know, my, my path. That's awesome. Yeah. It's interesting. Um, I was telling somebody today that I, you know, when I work with somebody who's going through awakening process and so forth, I don't really impose a framework on, on their experience of, of how it has to play out because I find people know how to wake up. Of course they, they know how, how can you not know how to find your way back to your true nature that you never left. Right. There is some work to do, of course, but, but in the, the gist of it is that, you know, you, you really at some point have to trust your own intuition, really your own wordless, thoughtless intuition and follow it all the way down. Um, but anyway, in reflection, uh, I love that you described how those practices converged and, and it wasn't something that you were initially aware of the, the fact that they, that, that sort of float practice was a meditative practice and, and so forth. But, um, 
but I like how you organically figured it out. Uh, you, you trusted your experience. You trusted that, that, uh, um, that the seeking uh, uh, itself uh, was relevant and you trusted your, your instinct to do something that people might even think is a little bizarre or a lot bizarre. And yet you knew that there was something there and it starts to converge as you recognize that the meditative you know, practice, the float practice or sensory deprivation practice um, can actually intermingle and be one in the same. Um, so that's very cool. Uh, so then uh, I guess I want to ask you, what, how did you decide to, to come to a retreat or had you done retreats before the retreat where we met? No, not really. I mean, I've done um, a few other re- retreats, but nothing like that. We're six days of silent meditation, mm-hmm. you know, and part of me, I was called to do it, Angelo, but, um, you know, part of me was like, how, how am I going to, how, how is how is that going to be? Like, I've never been like, that's deep stuff, man, like six days. And um, it was just such a beautiful uh, retreat. And the, the Asilomar was just such a, a great place for healing and experiencing. And, you know, your what you brought to that in terms of guiding the group. And I had never really done anything like that before. But, um, you know, I was called to do it. And, you know, like I said, it was just quite fortuitous how, like, I almost feel like the universe conspired to bring us all together and to mm-hmm. share in that, in that experience. It was you know, truly yeah. awesome. Yeah. It's, it's such an incredible experience. Uh, it, and it always has its own flavor. Every retreat is, is, is different in some sense, but also every retreat has that, that incredible depth where everybody walks out of the other side of it, just going, wow, I'm glad <laughs> I made it to that. However that happened. Um, yeah. I need to get a shirt that says like, I, I survived the <laughs> retreat or something. <laughs> yeah. Right. Exactly. Uh, it was, it was cool, man. Did you find, um, yeah, for somebody maybe who hasn't done retreat, I, I'm just curious if you could like sketch generally speaking, how did it go for you? Did you find there were very challenging times or not so much? Did you find like fluctuation in your experience or was it all relaxing or how did it play out for you? It's a great question. I think, um, the first day, um, where I was, you know, coming out of like the, the normal day to day. And, you know, I had, you know, just my egoic presence, you know, the, the doership, you know, aspect of, of, you know, how I exist and who I am and in that capacity, you know, stepping into that first day, it was um, a little challenging just trying to quiet the mind. And, and then, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, I just leaned into it and uh, I, I knew enough about, um, just in my own practice that I have to trust in the process, not knowing where the process would take me, but just to lean into it. Mm. And, um, I would say like day two, three, four, five, six, uh, you know, I, I just was so open and aware and, uh, awake. And I had just moments where, and it wasn't even just in the silent, like meditation, you know, like I, was experiencing that and um and it was so beautiful but then it was like when i would go back uh to my room and then just like sit back and and you know and lay in bed and just breathe and and then i i would just be flooded with like i even had a moment where i just felt like every bit of suffering in the world and almost transcended that and and then just started feeling just all this unfiltered reality and just perception. And it was just, it culminated like Mm -hmm. over, over those days. And, and then I, upon leaving the retreat, you know, I, I just was so like called to like, not, not let it go. You know, like I have, I I like, there's so many things you do in life where, you know, you have might have an epiphany or a glimpse and then, and then you just, then you just go back into the world. And, and, and I, I, so as I started getting into the end of the retreat, you know, I, I just kept thinking like, I have to integrate and, uh, and, 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 uh, and, and, you know, and and part of it was, you know, like I I didn't want to, and I I think you brought a lot of, you gave me a lot of perspective on, you know, like you, you gave pointers and we, we talked a lot about different, different things and Zen and, but I, but just don't, don't try to study all that because you can just read and, and you have all this book knowledge, but then experientially, like, if you don't trust in the process, 
just so just focus on the process. And that's what I did. And uh, it's not that learning isn't a part of it, but it's more adjunct or integrative to that overall process. So, you know, that was that was kind of what I learned. And, and then just the the connections during that retreat, um, I just felt like the the there was almost like a harmony or a cohesion that the group brought. So it wasn't just me singularly being in my present moment, but just everyone else's presence, you know, really fed into that energetic uh, sense of healing that, mm-hmm. that I needed. And I think everyone at the retreat needed and why they were called to attend. So, um, yeah, yeah, it was, it was, it was really monumental. It was yeah, really cool, man. Awesome. Yeah. I think that's well said. That's, that's how I experience it as well. It's, I don't uh, feel as like I'm this teacher and there's people I'm talking to, or it doesn't feel like that. It feels like a retreat retreating itself. It's, it's like the whole environment is just doing something. It's, it's wild, you know, and it's just yeah. opening to this deep, deep, you know, experience and everyone there knows that and they may interpret it in different ways, but it's, it's obvious and it's obvious yeah. to everyone that it's obvious to everyone. It's really cool. Um, so then, uh, one day after retreat finished, I think you it was, you sent me an email and you said tonight something shifted or there was definitely an opening, um, to, I, I thought about reading it, but I'm like, well, I'll, I'll let you say it because it was very eloquent the way you wrote it. But, um, you said something definitely shifted or changed here. Uh, I think it was literally one day after the retreat ended, if I remember right. Yeah. You know, I came back, uh, from retreat and, uh, my wife and my daughter were out of town and it was good timing for me just to sit and reflect and be in that moment. And, um, I was just, just feeling such loving awareness and knowing. And, uh, I think where, like I had this, this, this breakthrough was just, this sense of radical intimacy, the intimacy of like being alive and being in nature. So, you know, I, I spent like an entire day just, just, just loving and being and, and transcending and feeling those textures of experience. And, you know, like I, I, I could see like matter, like a glass of water. Um, but I could feel like the experience that, that vessel, um, as something more than just, you know, like matter, but it was just like some kind of like energetic thing. And I have like, I had this like light, uh, night light and it was like a Nautilus shell and I would look at it and just see these amazing, like beautiful fractals and, and then just really connecting. And, you know, um, part of what I learned at the retreat, Um, And I had never done this in my meditation practice before, and this was a major breakthrough, but just the self, the the self inquiry. And I'm still trying to learn about koans and I want you to teach me some of that maybe someday. I'm trying to read a little bit about it, but you had mentioned the uh, moo and uh, just nothingness and like, does a dog like have a Buddha nature? And I was sitting in bed and, you know, my, my dog was just snoring and I could just feel uh just such being and and just just feel such intimacy with that with with that creature Mm -hmm. (laughs) my my dog and and uh just loving presence and you know the i feel like i had a lot of glimpses and uh and then when i came back to assimilate you know into like the ordinary like dualistic world like i i just felt like uh you know, I, um, you know, like there's, I, I have like true nature now. Like, and then I had these moments where like, I was just like breathing and, uh, and I could feel like oh, oh, awareness and, you know, my own breath and, and just, and then I had, um, you know, you had, um, uh, mentioned, uh, like we had a poetry reading and, uh, you read that the lyrics, of that tool song, uh, you know, and it was, it, you know, I, I started thinking about shadow work and like, I don't know. And like part of, and like, I was thinking about that. And then, um, like one of my breakthroughs, um, I, along the way was I read, uh, power of now Eckhart Tolle, you, you know, and we talked about it on my podcast, just the, the kind of the pain, but emotional pain body. And I, I, I could just sense like this, um, almost like this, uh, like sludge, you know, like, you know, something that was energetically, um, was, was off balance and then just letting go, like, 
like almost like the, the that the lyrics of that song talk about like the the picking of the scab you know like opening up and 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 so i don't know i just kind of uh sensed into that and i know it sounds like for if someone's watching this they're gonna be like what is he talking about it's like <laughs> dude's nuts but but you know i i just um was able to just feel such peace and then just through my own like micro traumas and different abrasions that happen. Like I was able almost to like, just feel like uh, energetically clean Mm -hmm. and uh, just aware and, uh, and, and just present in the moment. So that was kind of my, you know, like my first night back, you know, what that was like, and Mm -hmm. it was really cool. And I'm still sensing into that. I I still feel that every day, like just, just being awake. It's really Mm -hmm. cool, man. Like you you have, Uh, you're bringing a gift to the world. (laughs) Yeah. So I love, I love listening to you talk about this because I know it's, it is very difficult to talk about you and you, um, the flavor of this, this shift for you, this flavor of this awakening is very, uh, I'll just say it's very heart-based. You're, you just, you just move that way. It's just energetic for you. Conditions, you know, uh, come forth how they do could be karmic, who knows, but, um, but it, it, what you're the, the aspect of realization that, that really, um, is prominent in your expression in the way you describe this shift and this, these insights is, um, it's a little bit uncommon actually. It's, and it's at least with a first awakening, it tends to come a little later. Um, but it, it's, it's even harder to talk about than this, um, this sort of, uh, transcendent shift in identity, the disidentification from thoughts and so forth that that's also hard to talk about, but what you're pointing to is really something you have to intuit into. So anyway, I, um, I can clearly feel it. Uh, and it is, um, you just, you just energetically move that way. You're very heart-based, very compassion-based. I could almost say it's, it's moving in the feminine aspect, not based on gender or human gender or anything like that. Um, but a, a lot of times the first awakening tends to be skewed, skewed to the masculine, a little bit distorted. Um, this type, this type of awakening or this flavor is, is quite balanced actually in the masculine and feminine aspect, feminine aspect being, if you think about like dependent origination, that that uh, sort of let's say two things come into being that are uh, intertwined, interdependent, and really of the same identity, and the fact and and the mere fact that they apparently come into to existence at all is why there is even identity in any way at all. There's even texture of experience, and yet they are never apart at all. They're never they're never two really. That's the feminine aspect. So you can see how that dependent co-arising model is really interesting because it does show energetically the masculine and feminine aspect and how they're intertwined and they're they're actually they are dependently originated they're they're necessary for one another anyway the way you express is is very balanced that way it's very cool and um yeah i can totally feel it but it's very hard to talk about it is it's really hard to talk about when you say i look at a simple mundane object and i see the particles in that I'll even take it a little bit farther. You you can see the whole universe in that, but you know, you know, it's crazy talk. So it's hard to talk about that. Right. But the intimacy is, is remarkable. It's undeniable. It's, it's almost as if you're in two places at once. It's you, what it, what it really comes down to, I think is uh, you use the word equanimity a lot. And I like that because the realization of equanimity is often a sort of stage that happens after awakening for people. And sometimes it takes quite a while for that to be re- realized. But one of the upshots of that realization or that shift in perception is suddenly seeing that the belief that I am the center of what's important in my experience really has no relevance. It doesn't make sense. It's just all of this is, is in a sense, equally important but when that happens, when that perceptual filter falls that I am the most important thing in this environment, um, all of a sudden things look very different. The intimacy just amps up and it, it's this very cool flow and um, sort of uh, it, it's almost like a choreo- choreographed experience of interdependence um, arising and, and, and also a, a deep enjoyment in everything the mundane becomes incredibly enjoyable because you, you can just feel if identity is anywhere, it's there and here. Yeah. And, um, and, and it just opens up these channels of experience that, that we filter out a lot of the time. So that's what I'm, I'm saying a lot in re- return, but I, I want to just acknowledge that's what I'm feeling when you speak in this way, like 
as I did in your writing, that you really know this intimacy aspect, the heart-based aspect, which is really important and probably one of the more overlooked aspects of realization um, uh, for, for a while until things get really clear uh, at deeper realization where they do tend to balance out. Um, so I just want to acknowledge that. But uh, how have you noticed um, this integrating into your life uh, afterwards, as far as just how you're moving through the world, how you're interacting with people? Have you noticed some sort of unfolding effects later on? I have. Um, you know, I, this whole awakening, you know, it's made me a better husband, a better father, a better friend. Um, you know, and then I, I've had just this, um, I mean, I can't put it in words, Angelo, but I have had so many great things happen to me just in the last few weeks since I've been back. I mean, like game changing things in my life, like such positivity. And I can't help but think that it's because of the way that I'm interfacing with the world and how that resonates in a way. And, you know, and it's almost like, if meditation is the medicine and not everyone can do a six day retreat, but I'm flowing in that medicine then I can be the medicine for other people. And then through that, it'll gravitate and energetically um, create um, opportunities. And, and the opportunities that I'm talking about are things to, to really like heal the world. Like, and I, I know that sounds like I'm not trying to be like egoic and saying that, but I, I really feel called in what I do. And I, I feel like professionally, you know, like part of my journey has been like, yeah, you know, I told you I had some suffering in my like prior work experiences. And I, I, I really feel like there's almost like a blue flame where there's an intersection of like what you're really good at and what you're passionate about. And if you could find like that intersection, then things blossom and open up. And I really kind of feel like in the, in the few weeks that I've been back, I've just been in this stride of like, <laughs> just experience and and uh you know there's some things that you know like are going to be announced and and things that are going to be happening that and things that i'm leading that i feel like uh like i'm 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 in a position to um to not achieve or accomplish um but to to serve you know Mm -hmm. Like my prior self, my doer self would say, oh, you know, you got to accomplish and you got to get another like certificate on the wall like I have here. That's not about that. It's just really about giving into the world to try to, and you know, I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm not, again, I'm not like saying, you know, like I'm anything special in terms of like this, 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 this person, um, but I am, but you know what I mean? In terms of like, just feeling in and, and loving. And, uh, I, I just feel like there's, um, just a, a passion that I have now that I, it's just so, so amazing and profound. And I really found it interesting, Angelo, when you talked about the, the, the male and the female aspect, um, there was someone at the retreat, um, you know, at the end, uh, she came up to me and said, you know, you have such a, I, I've never sent such a, like a, a feminine, like energy in a, in a man. And I don't mean that in like a, it's not, you know, it's like just a, a, like a loving presence. And, you know, there was, you know, there's some um, people, you know, like women that I know have been harmed by kind of the masculine, you know, and, and uh, there's like the trust and, and I really connected with someone at the retreat that kind of told me that, and I didn't know what to make out of that. And so I just found it odd that, that you mentioned it, but I I think it's just trying to find the balance, you know, of like, of those energies Mm -hmm. and then just trying to like, you know, again, I'm trying to, put labels or words into it, but it's difficult, but just trying to sense into, you know, just loving presence. Mm -hmm. And that's really what I think has been just such a big shift for for me in terms of having this um, expansive consciousness is just, um, yeah, just, just, just feeling in, you know, Mm -hmm. and, and uh, loving every moment and, Mm -hmm. and being present for my family and my friends and the people that I'm here to serve. So, Mm -hmm. yeah, it's really cool. Again, you know, thank you for bringing that gift uh, because, you know, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of great things happen at that retreat and certainly gave me a lot of pointers and and things that I've, I've been able to carry forward. 
Yeah. Um, so, uh, the, the mat, just to clarify the masculine feminine thing, you know, I, I used to never use that term because I, I didn't really know fully what people meant, especially in sort of spiritual circles by it until I, until it really clicked for me the, energetically, what exactly that is. And it, it really doesn't have to do with human gender so much, um, because every, every human being male and female and, and any other intergender, anything, um, we all have different aspects of masculine and feminine energies in balance in some places, out of balance in some places, expressing more prominently in certain situations and so forth. Um, but generally speaking, humans uh, and people in the West tend to be sort of skewed to the masculine in general, women and men do. Um, and it, there, I don't want to go into a lot of detail, but there tends to be reasons for that and so forth. But I find, you know, heart-based people or people who move naturally in both the feminine and masculine, which is how I would describe you, you, you know, your, your sort of phenotype is, is masculine. Of course, uh, that's how you come across, but energetically there's a balance there, which is very nice. And, and it's just that, it's just that warmth, the heart-based, you know, feeling, um, you're very extremely approachable personally. If anyone were to walk up to you, you're just a very approachable guy. You, I can feel that you already care just because we're interacting. You, you have that sort of vibe that's unmistakable, which is really cool. Um, so that's mostly kind of what I, what I mean by that. And probably what the, the person at retreat told you as well. Um, but, uh, yeah. And so the other thing that came up when you were talking about this and talking about retreat, um, the, oh, okay. So, uh, how you feel called to serve. Um, uh, can you tell me a little bit more about like how, um, do you make distinctions between serving in, you know, this, this context versus that context versus when you're alone with your, you know, with the, the objects in the room, or you're just by yourself in a quote unquote mundane situation? Do you feel like service is, is based on context or is service something that can be expressed sort of all the time or moment to moment? I think it's the latter, you know, like, you know, what I experienced in terms of kind of the, the no world, non-dual perspective, you know, and you, you mentioned this in the, during the retreat, during one of your talks about, you know, like we think of like experience as linear where you have a past and a future and all of our thoughts are, are like focused on one or the other, but just being in the present where there, there is nothing more there, there, there's no problems. There's nothing to struggle against. And, you know, that's, that's where I feel like I'm called like to serve others energetically in terms of not worrying about the world. Like we have such calamity in terms of, you know, economic, uh, 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 despair and, uh, you know, climate, you know, change and, uh, suffering because of pandemic and social isolation and behavioral health issues. And I spend my career, you know, all like exploring all of these different, um, topics, um, uh, you know, but I, I, but that's, that's my call to serve is just to raise awareness. And I do that through loving awareness where just being in the moment where I, I don't feel a sense of, um, uh, despair, but I have in through my sense of living truth, uh, a, a loving awareness or almost like a Samadhi, a deep Samadhi where just unconditional experience that these are all just textures and momentary life and, uh, and not to, I guess, you know, fo fixate on, on negative. So that's just in terms of how I think that way. And I'm not saying like it's right or wrong, but it feels right to me. Mm -hmm. It's just the knowing or the, I am in terms of all that is and all that ever was my true self, my sense of being undifferentiated and connected, like the, the self and the world are all one and the same. Mm -hmm. Like for me, that's the, the transcendence of, of suffering or equanimity so through my own experience feeling into that, I just feel compelled to just like, it's almost like my kind of altruistic uh, purpose or rationale to just serve others. And again, I'm not like any, I'm not any big, you know, like 
guy, like, you know, politically or whatever, I'm just doing my thing. But, but I, I just feel like, you know, like there's a, just a calling that I have that, you know, I just feel like if I have this gift of awakening, you know, again, like I, I know others can't, not everyone. I mean, I, I don't know what the percentage is, Angela, like people that do stuff like this, like six days of silent meditation. It's probably, it's probably 0.1% of people, but, but just flowing into that, that medicine, if you will, mm-hmm. and just kind of reflecting it out. And, and that's like my call to serve is just being present and being the best you know, human being I can be by connecting with others, that whole like dependent origination aspect of where like, we're all like kind of, I don't know if that's the right word, but just the interconnectedness, Mm -hmm. like just feeling like, you know, like I, I owe it to not only myself and, uh, but others just to not overly identify with ego Mm -hmm. and, and just feel into the moment. And that's Mm -hmm. kind of what I'm, my whole awakening process is just simply being you know uh living in that way that living truth if you will Mm -hmm. i don't know if if i'm saying it the right way but that's kind of how i feel yeah yeah it comes across pretty clear i think uh one other thing i was going to reflect on earlier and it came to me again here was the the sense i get from you is just this this willingness um to show up in in whatever's happening to the um that could be called service for sure but to show up authentically. That's, that's what I feel when I talk to you. It's like, um, you, you're good with words, but you also know that no word can really point to what we're talking about. Exactly. It's, it's just sort of ineffable. It's more, it's a little bit too real for words in a sense. Um, and, and yet it's, it's what we orient toward. It's, it's kind of the, you know, once you taste that, what, you know, why get hung up in thoughts and, and beliefs about the past and future? Because it's, it's right here. And um, you mentioned the textures as well, which I, I really like is that that is, it is sort of um, it's just sort of a kaleidoscope of textures. That's if, if I could tell, say what presence is, that's one way of saying it. It's that this moment is a kaleidoscope of textures and you, your job, if any, is to show up and that, and service is showing up in a sense, but um, uh yeah, I, I I vibe with you. Like I, I I totally get when you when you speak about these these experiences or your your motivations and so forth. I can totally vibe with. I can feel into it for sure. And um, yeah, it, it feels like this sort of authenticity, willingness, and um, intention to live life in presence, really. And as as simple as that sounds, I think it's it's a very very powerful movement. It's a very powerful orientation to really just commit to presence and see what's not here is not here. Presence is here, you know, and we can, we can inhabit it at deeper levels, more subtle levels and so forth by, by intention and by um, heart opening really. You know, part of the, that sense of authenticity that I have is that I, I no longer have fear and people judging me like this whole, like talking, having this conversation, like my prior self would be like, I'll never like speak about this openly because, you know, people are going to think I'm cuckoo and hippy dippy weirdo, like kind of, you know, guru stuff. But, you know, I, I like just being authentic and being awake. It's not like I owe it to anybody. Like I have to evangelize this stuff. I mean, people either, you know, like listen to this or in, you know, something connects or clicks and resonates or they just turn it off. But, and I'm not trying to, I think in my own authentic, awesome. I think I heard the word uh, somewhere like Zen stink where, you know, people like come back and they're awake and like, Oh my God, I got to tell everyone and you got to do this. And <laughs> like me being authentic is just so much of like, I just want to experience and be aware and, and have compassion and, uh, and, and just feel that unconditional love. And, and, you know, and if someone asks me about it, yeah, I'll talk about it, but I don't, I'm not, I'm not going to worry about like people thinking, Oh, like, you know, that, that guy's weird because that's, that's just an, an egoic type of um, thought, you know, mm-hmm. like why, why worry about something that I feel is the, you know, a living truth, you know, mm-hmm. and, and impactful for me, if it can help me, then and it can certainly help others. And if others want to know a little bit more about this process, I'm, I'm happy to talk about it. So I, I appreciate you um, inviting me on this show. I mean, you even said like, Hey, you know, like you don't have to do it. 
uh, you know, and even if after we record it, you know, if you just if you change your mind, like it's all cool. And, uh, but you know, I, I just feel like just being authentic requires not requires, I don't know if that's the right word, but just, you know, I, I, I feel open. And, uh, you know, if, if there's, if there's other people that want to have this kind of experience, uh, you know, I just would encourage them to learn and to feel into that and into it and emote that, that type of, um, um, path to, to feeling this, this awakening. It's, it's really cool stuff. Mm. Yeah. One of the things that's quite striking after the ball really gets rolling with this process is we really learn to live unguarded in certain ways that we maybe didn't realize we were guarding even maybe we did sometimes maybe we didn't but yeah you just learn to live sort of in the, in sort of in the raw that it really is what that tool song 46 and 2 uh 46 and 2 is about it is li- is like you know he's he's talking about feeling into his muscle memory you know letting go of all the things he's been clinging to and and that but it it just has that rawness to it and there is something about that but it's also authenticity that that rawness is authenticity we all humans have these these parts of ourselves that are that are um you know that we guard with with our ego structures and so forth but they're like the most tender parts of ourselves the most um in a sense sometimes the most intuitive the most loving parts of ourselves and at some point it's like oh well that's just going to be worn on the outside now you know not not always in every situation but but we're compelled more and more to really live in authenticity to communicate in authenticity and so forth um and you you made a good you made a very compelling statement about that in in what you, with what you just said to anyone who's listening and that is you know trust your trust your authentic self even if you've learned not to trust it even if you've learned to even hide part of yourself even from yourself bring it forward touch in see see what it's saying you know be willing to address those parts of ourselves that that we, um, through who knows what communication, habituation, conditioning, we've learned to hide that that's what we mean by authenticity. It's at least that's what I mean by authenticity. And that's what really gets this process rolling for people. It's not necessarily which book you read or becoming a Buddhist or starting to meditate. All those things can be helpful or whatever, but what really gets the ball rolling is authenticity. And, and part of the authenticity is like, man, I feel a lot of suffering in myself. I feel it around me. Um, and also there's this voice somewhere in me. It's this, not a voice in words, not a voice in thoughts, but a, an impulse, an instinct to, to open up, to, uh, to endeavor, uh, to um, start to navigate some deeper part of myself. Like I really feel that. And this message that you and I are communicating is, is saying, hey, you can address that and you should address that. And it's okay to address that. And you'll be very surprised where it leads you. <laughs> Yo, I know there's just, it's so um, sublime, you know, just, uh, you know, I, I, I just can't tell you how, how much uh, just awe I have for the beauty of life and the sublimity and knowing. And, uh, and again, like, I, I don't feel like, uh, like I have to scream from the rooftops and, and, you know, and, and tell everyone, Oh, you got to do this, but just feeling that knowing, you know, and, and being awake, I, I just feel like, I have to be authentically true and in my myself and 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 it, it is a kind of a raw kind of sense of like being open mm-hmm. and um it, it it makes life it's it's just so much more rewarding to live that way where you're not like you're not entangled in thoughts and ego and judgments about judgments and who's gonna you know think certain things like it's just I think that's that's a big part of my shift is just knowing that that you know I can be awake and I can be a normal human being too and I don't have to you know worry about you know people thinking I'm weird you know mm-hmm. and and this is really um again like I, I can't tell you like I how many people I told I was going on a 6 day like meditation retreat and they're like dude like <laughs> what what something's off with you and I'm like okay you know like all right well th- that's okay yeah. Uh, and I know Zubin had the same thoughts when he, uh, you know, was going out, you know, he was, he, you know, you and him had such a powerful connection, but he was like, oh my gosh, like I'm bringing like so many like uh, followers and like the stakes are high and I hope this goes well. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, but, you know, it's just, so, it's so, it's such a great, you know, I, I, again, I just think what you're doing, you know, with these retreats and, and just your book, I mean, I, I read your book and I have to tell you too, like, 
I got it a few months before the retreat and, you know, I highlighted and underlined and thought and go, would go back and I would, I would get glimpses. And then it was like, when I, when I went to the retreat, it was like, boom, like everything, it all connected and made sense in a way that I could have read that book like 20 times and never, never had that, that connection. Mm -hmm. And a big part of that again was like the self-inquiry part. Like that was powerful because I would meditate, um, but never, like I would just be quiet and and that's great. Um, But then just being able to like almost like, you know, like throw that, like that spear into like, that vast nothingness and then draw from that and, and then just open my heart. And, uh, you know, that was, that, that was the coolest thing I think about the retreat for me. It was just like learning that, that part of the process. Beautiful. Awesome, man. Yeah. There were a handful of people at the retreat. Um, I think there were like seven physicians there, a lot of healthcare people, but there were a handful of people who told me I would have never gone to a retreat like this, if I didn't see you and Zubin talking the way you did (laughs) kind of normalizing this process, but also that helps people to introspect and go, oh, okay, yeah, I, I can address this part of myself. This is, there's definitely something there. Um, and as I mentioned to Zubin, like in these in the interviews we're talking about, um, I, I mean, I really do think this will be this will be mainstream in ten or twenty years or so. I don't know how long, but you know, twenty years ago, meditation was kind of taboo, and now they're teaching it at you know Catholic hospitals and stuff. I mean, it's it's just so mainstream now in yoga and um, different kinds of traditions that, that have to do with mindfulness and so forth. So I think the true and authentic um, fundamental transformation and identity and how we experience moment to moment reality ourselves and the world that will be mainstream. I think it, it's it's just heading in that direction and. Um, and yeah, it, it, it's such a relief to give yourself permission to address that part of ourselves that just stays in the background so much. And then all of a sudden, whoa, it's in the foreground. I can actually live and breathe out of this now. It's wonderful. Yeah, I, well said. And, you know, uh, Zubin and I had a conversation at the retreat, you know, just in seeing kind of the directionality of, you know, where things are going in the world. And, uh, and, you know, and, you know, people talk about like, you know, like for us to heal almost, you know, as a society to have an awakening, you have to have like a black swan event and, you know, like there's different things happening. Certainly COVID-19 was a big thing, but then to have a, like a modicum of people that are truly awake, you know, that practices meditation, something that previously, you know, decades ago was taboo. Mm. Uh, that's kind of the, the ballast to which we can di- redirect and ultimately, you know, build a new, you know, future, um, which, which is kind of something I was thinking about was, you know, like, again, not everyone can do this, you know, type of work. You have to be called and you have to be open and you have to, there's a, it's, 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 it's hard work, you know, it really is like, uh, um, but it's so gratifying, but I think just being awake and flowing into that experience and then just being authentic, like that's enough to, to help redirect and, and, and be a force a force multiplier for the rest, you know, of the world that needs it. I, yeah. So I'm hopeful. I, I think, yeah, I agree. I think in, I don't know how long, 10, 20 years, like this could be, you know, like we, this could reach a critical mass where mm-hmm. more and more people are drawn to this type of work. Yeah. All right. Um, well, I appreciate all your reflections and uh, I think this is, going to be helpful to people. Uh, Every time we do one of these, I'm always just uh, so happy about it because, you know, different people from different walks of life, doesn't matter if you're this, anyone who watches my videos knows this message. doesn't matter if you're 18 or 78 years old, male, female, straight, gay, professional, blue collar, white collar, unemployed. It doesn't, doesn't matter. Like if you, if this, if you're called to do this, if you're this part of yourself, you want to address, um, is, is trying to come forward, you can acknowledge it and you can do it. And so, yeah, every, every walk of life is, I try to represent in these, in these different conversations and so forth. And, um, you bring, a, a, a unique view and, um, a persona, um, that a lot of people are going to be able to re- relate to. So, so I appreciate your time. And, um, I will put the, I'll put a link to your podcast as well under this video. So if anyone wants to find that, they can. Great. Well, thanks brother. Appreciate yeah. it. Yeah. Thanks Eric. I appreciate your time, man. Yeah, absolutely. It was okay. Nice being with you today, Angelo. You too.